Hi, good afternoon. So today we are starting the second session in this uh, series of uh, lectures on machine learning. And today we are going to talk about supervised uh, learning. And what I bring for you today is this program. So we're going to talk about linear regression, polynomial regression, uh, some other more exotic kind of uh, linear regression, so like last or rich elastic net. Logistic regression, which is, uh, the name is a bit misleading, is, is actually doing classification, but it's for historical reasons it's called logistic regression, and super vector machines. And for the hands-on supervised learning, uh, what I have in mind is to predict the price of a vacation rental in Frankfurt. So <laughs> there is a, a guy who took the data from Airbnb and uh, did a script to get automatically the data from the website and he made this data available. So we know for which property, how much it costs to stay over. And we want to try to predict these prices. So let's start. S linear regression. So if we have this data, I think it's understood. What we mean by linear regression is we just fit a line, and fitting the line is finding which are the parameters that best fit this data. So in this case, uh, these are the values, and then we plug the values in the formula, and we can uh, do this prediction. So the question is, how do we just found these values? And these values are the values that minimize the mean squared error. So this is the formula for the mean squared error. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the mathematical notation, but in reality, what it's doing is, is taking the distance between the prediction and the error. You see the mouse? Yeah. Between the prediction and the error, and square it, and you do the average. So it's uh, not rocket science, oh? it's quite easy. <laughs> so, but how do we know which are the values that minimize the, the mean squared error? And to know it, which are these values, we need to ask to, the, to, to, uh, <laughs> to Gauss, the same <laughs> Gauss from the Gauss distribution, who invented the, the last square method. And he was uh, so proud that he invented it, that he used it the first time to predict where the Ceres asteroid will be. So Ceres uh, was uh, in traverse and went under the sun, or let's say under, behind the sun, so that it was not visible anymore. And he was the, one, the only one able at the time to predict where Ceres will be after it was visible again. If it is somebody from mission analysis, flight dynamics, that <laughs> want to elaborate on this, <laughs> it's also fine. So now to come a bit further with the discussion, we need to do some notation. Here I have uh, a bit of a problem, because I, I said in the first presentation that I want to favor intuition over formulas. And now I'm going to give you some formulas. So how <laughs> this matches? <laughs> Uh, so this is the compromise. Uh, what I'm going to do is that when the math are easy, I give you the math formulas to for you to know what is uh, behind, and then the concepts that we learn with these easy formulas, we will apply for when things are getting more complex in other techniques, but then we refer to the concept instead of the formula. So if this is a good uh, deal, Stay with me, it's a very simple math. Eh? So this is the, the formula of a line, and we can write the other way. This is uh, making it uh, only a bit more convenient. And we need to do this convention, uh, this notation, because we only have one variable in the example, but we want to expand to several variables. So we want to put, I don't know how many rooms are in the apartment, or how many reviews, or which is a review, so we have several variables. So we are doing this step, how we go from one variable to several in this notation. And we can write it like this. So our 
data, so x, will be 1 and x, and our weights will be b and w. So we'll multiply 1 times b plus x times w. So easy so far. No? So how do we do with, with several variables? It's a bit like this. It's the same thing. We multiply x0 by w0, x1 times w1, so on, with the convention that x0 will be 1 and w0 will be b for the bias. No? Uh, to be a bit more concrete, if we have this formula, this is how it looks like. So we have our data. x0 will be the bias term, so the b in this formula. And x1 will be this data, so like 0, 2.5, 5, these kind of things. And y will be what we want to predict. So in this sense, in this notation, x is this matrix that contains as row is number of uh, data samples, a number of points, and columns is number of features. So at the end, it's a vector. OK, so knowing this, we go back to Gauss. And Gauss told us, if you want to find which is the optimal line, you just apply this formula. Here you go. So I'm not going to detail how he found this formula. He did it. But uh, what I want to, the message I want to pass on is that there is a formula to compute this. And uh, this is uh, also for notation when you have a hat. So like a W hat is that is estimation. So it's not the real thing. You don't know what's the real, but this is the estimation. So you need to transpose the matrix, multiply, do matrix inversion, multiply again for the transpose and multiply by the solution. So if you do all that, you're done. Uh, and then you get your line, and you estimate the parameters for the line. What I want to say is that there is another way. This is the analytical way, or the closed form way. But there is a way that uh, to get this parameter with the optimization technique. Uh, the optimization technique that we're going to use is called gradient descent, because is used in many other machine learning techniques like uh, deep learning, neural networks, and so And you see it appearing across many, many different uh, problems. So if you remember our uh, mean square error formula, so we compute the difference to the square and get the, the average, we are going to call this cost. This is our cost that we want to minimize. and. This is how it looks. So this requires a bit of explanation. And uh, you can think of this like a square function. A square function has the this uh, shape, like a ball that we see there. And we can compute any time, any, uh, the, which is our error. So the error could be here, or could be there. And we know that we want to go down in the error. So we want to go in this direction. If we're there, we want to go down. And because the if this is measuring the error, the smaller the error is, this is the better the solution goes. No? Uh, so what we do is that since we know every time where we are, we can compute the gradient. The gradient is uh, this line there. So the gradient is, you can also call it a derivative or, or slope. So if you have a slope. And knowing the slope, you know that you want to go down proportional to the opposite direction of the slope. So the slope here in this uh, uh, picture is going up. So you want to go down. And the if the slope is like this, you want to go down a bit less. If it is like that, you want to be more. So you want to be down proportional. And this is the, the formula for learning. So you update the weights by going down, so going in the opposite direction of the slope, proportional to the derivative for every of the, uh, let's say, variables that you have. This alpha here is called the learning rate. So you can decide how fast or how big these steps will be. If they are too small, then it takes some time to go. 
if it is uh, too big, I don't know if you see the mouse, then this can be here, there. So you need to, to choose an appropriate learning rate. And what I say is that you have this shape that is a, like a bowl. And this was a line like this in one dimension, but if you have two dimension, you will see like uh, this, and uh, this is a, proje a projection. So when you see it painted on the floor, you will see like that. And I'm telling you this because uh, when we use this uh, gradient descent technique, it's important that we normalize the features. So what do I mean to normalize? Normalize is to put them in the similar scale. And for instance, if in the exercise we're going to do, if the number of reviews goes between 0 and 500, and the number of rooms goes between 1 and 8, instead of having the nice shape, we have a shape which is quite elongated just because the dimension of the feature is different. And it's much, easy, much more difficult to converge. So to make it easier to converge, we put them in the same scale, and we have this rounded bowl. So when, we, when do we use the formula from Gauss? or when do we use this optimization? Uh, I will say that for the last square method, we can use it then when the, there is a relatively small number of features, so let's say less than 1,000 features. But when there is more feature, it's better to use the gradient descent. The reason for that is that uh, it takes a lot of time to do this matrix multiplication. So if you have a lot of data, uh, is not there is no way that you can transpose the matrix a bit, or that you can do matrix inversion a little inversion. No, either you do it or you don't. So you need it to do in a block. Well, for the optimization, uh, you can stop at any time. So maybe you can say half one minute, and tell me the best solution you can find one minute. And w one minute you're done. Or even if the data doesn't fit in memory, it still will work because you can use some part of the data to find optimization or the part to continue, and you keep with the ball rolling down. Polynomial regression. So we <laughs> so far we're done with the uh, linear regression. How do we do polynomial regression? Uh, I generated this data with this formula, so notice that I put in red that we have this x to the square. And if we try to fit with the linear regression, it it's obvious that it doesn't work. So we need something else. Um, what I wanted to say is that you already know how to do it from what we discussed. It's not a new technique, it's a feature. So if this was our data before, now you will compute yourself x to the square, and then you use a linear regression. So it's nothing fancy, is that you add some feature, like a feature engineering, you know that maybe x uh, to the power of 2 somehow influences it. You add it and use normal linear regression. So you can be creative. You can, if you have several features like a x and z, you can combine the way you like. So it's nothing special about the polynomial regression. Some fancy uh, linear regression. So we have uh, reach, I don't know really hard to say that. I don't, I don't talk to anyone, so I don't, don't know if the pronunciation is good. Rich regression, lasso and elastic neck. So for the rich regression, I don't know if you remember still, the gradient descent, where we have the, the mean square error, and we optimize, and we have this learning proportional to the slope. So what we're going to do is we add a regular regularization term. This is uh, one of the tricks that you see most and mostly repeated in machine learning. So what we really want is to reduce the error, but we're going to do optimization on something else, and this something else will help us to generalize better, even if what we really care is about minimizing the error. So the trick is the following. For the cost function would be the mean square error and a penalty. So uh, 
if you remember in our notation w was the weight so what we want really is to have as the small less uh, weights as possible so we want to minimize this time the our shape here will be not only the error but also how big our weights are so what's the point of this why are we doing that uh, because you might have some uh, parameters or some features that are maybe partially correlated among them so you want to find the combination that uh, will have the less noise for instance or maybe you have something irrelevant and like this reduces what you don't need and allows you to generalize better this is uh, called L2 penalty and thi this name L2 comes because we're computing like the uh, uh, Euclidean norm so L2 norm oh I went too fast this is the lasso regression is that the same idea but instead of using uh, this regularization term we use something different so we use the absolute value instead and uh, we call L1 penalty which is equivalent to Manhattan distance so and the the difference here uh, is for the same purpose in the if you like so it's to make the model simpler to try to reduce the amount of weight but this function uh, has the tendency of setting to zero the weights that are not needed so if you know you have many relevant features you will use the lasso regression and the features that you don't need will disappear or will tend to disappear uh, both for the last regression and reach you have this alpha parameter that controls how much weight you give to this uh, penalty minimization and the elastic net is a combination of two so you will have the normal mean square error the lasso regularization the rich regularization and you use this parameter r to say how much you want from which one so all together goes like this but since we went step by step i think it doesn't look too bad so which linear regression should you go for well i will say that in general it's always a good idea to put some regularization unless you know that all the data you need is there that everything is not uh, uh, correlated to each other so but the uh, rich is a is a good default if you have a uh, few relevant features and maybe you have some correlated features i will go for lasso if you have many relevant features or you have some correlation among them or elastic neck is uh, like a combination of two so you can have large number of features possibly many relevant and possibly some correlated so this is more or less when to use each one of those so far for for linear regression ah this is an example so something what i did is uh, i put 50 irrelevant features so i had uh, as relevant features x and x to the square and on top of it i put 50 other features that are random noise and i told linear regression to fit the model and you see that the li normal linear and rich mm, they try but they why not succeed well this is the lasso and the la elastic net that are more robust against uh, irrelevant features sure ah, okay yeah yeah it's a good question uh, I go here feature will be this one so like you have x0 x1 x2 so th uh, let's say every component in a in a vector and, um, for the underlying, uh, model, yeah it depends a bit if you know already that uh, there will be many irrelevant features maybe you can try lasso otherwise uh, rich is a good default and 
also you can do trial and error. So you can check if you're happy with the error that you get. If you're not, then you try something else. But uh, if you have more or less an idea of uh, how many relevant features there will be, or, or maybe what you're trying to do is, let's say that you have 100 features like this, and then you do polynomial regression, you multiply each to each other, so you know, you have 10,000. <laughs> and say, well, some of them will be relevant for sure, then you can already try that. So, this is where we were. Uh, well, at the end it's the same. It's a uh, polynomial features, and then uh, you put into a linear regression. Yeah. So far, Um, well, I, I did a trick uh, that is uh, in, in this machine learning libraries, you can give a set of uh, alphas and uh, R and uh, it will pack pick up the combination that uh, suits the best. So I took the best uh, for the data. Sure. No, no, it's, uh, it's really linear. Um, no, it's still linear in one dimension. So you will take 50 dimensions. And uh, uh, let's say, let's put maybe a concrete example because uh, to it looks maybe too abstract. Let's say, imagine that uh, we want to predict uh, the price of this house. No? And we know that uh, it has five stars with you, and it has two rooms. So we have two dimensions, the number of stars and the, the number of uh, rooms. And now we do compute also the square of the number of reviews, the square of the number of rooms, this uh, multiply the reviews by the number of rooms, whatever combination you like. And this you put together with some weight and you add them together. So to me, this is like a line in the sense that you have only your input, you put some weights and you add them all together. Uh, does it answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's do something. Le let's continue, and then uh, we put uh, all the questions to the end, if you like. Uh, this is what I wanted to say for the linear regression. Now we jump into logistic regression, which is uh, a tiny neural network, and it's tiny because it ex has exactly has one neuron, so only one. And this is the the structure. So you will take every input, you have some weights, and what you do is the same thing again. So you multiply y by the weight zero, x1, x x1 times w1, and so on. So it's the same as we did before for linear regression. So it's a linear combination, with the difference is that after you have computed that, you apply this function sigma. So if you like, y will be a function of this linear combination. And what is sigma? Sigma is the sigmoid function that has this shape. And the characteristic of a shape is that the values are between 0 and 1. So whatever the x, the minimum you can get is 0. And whatever the x, the maximum you can get is 1. And it's used to compute probabilities. So if we say, if we train uh, this uh, classifier to detect spam, not spam, and we say non spam will be 0, spam will be 1, and one day we get 0 0.8, 0 0.85, we say, okay, it's quite spammy. And for binary cl classification, what is done is that if a probability is more than 0 0.5, you will say it's the class 1, otherwise it's the class 0. So it's a bit restricted in the sense that you can only do classification 
or binary classification. So it's either 0 or 1, and you have all the range of probabilities. Okay? So let me put you an example. Imagine that we have this data, and we want to get the chance of passing an exam based on how much you studied. And for this particular exam, this is the data. So half an hour, one hour, it didn't pass. So zero is that it didn't pass. One is that the guy managed to pass the exam. And this is how much time he spent. So we put all the formula, we fit it, and there we go. So with this formula, we will know what's the probability. We put some hours, and you get the probability. So you know for this particular exam, if you study three hours or more, your chances are good that you pass the exam. Uh, let me give you a, another interpretation for that. This is how it works. So the zero part will be here. So this is the data corresponding to I didn't pass the exam. This is the data corresponding to I passed the exam. You will fit the line. And this is the way uh, to the right. You will say this is uh, more than 0 0.5. To the left is less, but it's always a continuous probability. So this is next time you're studying, you can get some data <laughs> and check how much you need to study. Uh, so how does it work? Oh, it's the same formula. This is the cost log. I'm not going to details for this one because it's uh, getting a bit uh, more complex, but the message I want to pass is that there is no formula to solve this problem like we had for the least square method. So it's only optimization like a gradient descent. And we can also use L1 and L2 regularization term as uh, we saw with the reach and with the lasso regression. Okay. What about if there are more than two classes? So it uh, can only say span or span, but what about, for instance, if we have these three flowers, and this is a typical problem in machine learning, and if we know the sepal and the petal length and width, can we name which kind of flower it is? So these are the three species, Cetosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. No? And the trick is that we will transform this problem into three binary classification problem. So we will say it is setosa versus it's not setosa. So it's one of them versus the other. So we can say if we are sure that are this one or is not. A graph uh, could be like this, for instance. For Iris Virginica, we can say, yes, uh, this is the probability we here. It's like zero, zero 0.8. And if we are there, we don't know which other it is. We know that it's only non iris virginica. And the good thing is that the machine learning libraries take care of this. And for us, it's sort of transparent. So we just use it, and they do this combination for us. And we get the probability for all three cases. In this case, it's not uh, as easy in the sense that whatever is more than 0 0.5, we will say that this is the the winner, but the something we do is we take the maximum, for instance, <laughs> if you need to decide, or if you want to work pr with probabilities, you still get the probabilities. So this is uh, for logistic regression. Now we go with the uh, support vector machine. It's uh, mostly used for classification. And it's also, again, using binary classification. can be one class or the other, uh, but it uses the same trick is uses one versus the other when you have multi-class. And this came for the realization that they wanted to have an optimal way to do the classification. Imagine this case. So we have two classes. We have, let's say, the blue class and the red class. And we want to find what is the optimal way to find the distinction among them. So we can decide that we will have this line Whatever goes to the left will be blue. Whatever is to the right is red. So we have a new point appearing, and they should be blue. But somehow this doesn't feel right. Uh, then let's try something else. And something else could be this other line. So whatever is on top of the line is blue, otherwise will be red. But if one day we have this point, it doesn't feel right that this should be blue. So 
support vector machines, what they do, this technique is that they have this separation. And it's called a maximum margin classifier. So it tries to find the separation with the maximum margin between the two classes. And the, the, the points which are close to this boundary are called support vector. So they are called vector because it's a, let's say, it's a data with several dimensions. So at the end, it's really a vector. And this, the support vector is the boundary decisions. What about if we have outliers? So we don't want to, to change our decision boundary just because of very few cases. So also for, su for, for support vector machines, we can have regularization. So we allow, uh, so with a penalty parameter, but it's time is C that is kind of inverse of the alpha. We can uh, allow for some exceptions and still maintain the, the boundary. Sometimes data is not as nicely <laughs> separated as in the example that I put. Sometimes data like this. So how can we distinguish between these two classes? And there is another trick in machine learning for this that is called the kernel trick. And the kernel trick is that you will invent a new dimension where you map this data. So something you can do is uh, polynomials or Gaussian or so. In this case, we can see the data like that. And then we can have an hyperplane that cuts the data into. So this is the, the kernel trick. It's the one <laughs> of the invention of machine learning. So where the super vector machines are good for? For instance, I don't know if you have a digital camera where they have face detection, not really to recognize, but to know where the faces are so that they can focus properly. Or Spans filter is uh, another example for super vector machines, or handwritten recognition. For space, there is uh, one example that I like it, is the NASA EO1 satellite. And what they did is that they at NASA had uh, super vector machines that they train on ground. And they train super vector machines and they were upload on board. And what, did, what do they use it for? They use it for image classification on real time. So imagine you have this picture on the left and on the right, they can say what is cloud, what is ice, and what is water. And for them, this was interesting in this case because they wanted to, to catch when the eyes was breaking up and take pictures in this moment. So it's more for opportunistic science, especially to reprioritize what you download to ground. For instance, this other case, there was detection of clouds and they decided that this image will not be downloaded. So if you are paying attention like a don't know, volcano eruption or oil spill or eyes uh, uh, break up and so, this can automatically tell you when this is happening on board. And this is already in 2004 that was happening. So for the Python hands-on, we're going to predict the prices of a vacation rental in Frankfurt. And for the next session, will be Next uh, Wednesday, this time this uh, room was taken, so we move to H1, and we're going to discuss decision trees, ensembles, and random forest. And there will be also some hands on. I think now is a good time for questions on the topic, and then I guess some of you will not be interested on, on the Python part, so it's also a good time to leave if you're not interested, or if, if otherwise you are welcome to stay. So if you have any questions, 